everyone in the room today. Uh, we have investors, we have regulators and policymakers, uh, educators as well. Everyone is here who has a, an interest, a strong interest in Africa, and in particular, uh, building agents of change and leadership opportunities, and especially opportunities for meaningful lives across Africa. So we're all here with our, our distinguished panelists for um, a specific, with a specific sense of urgency. Um, as you know, commodity prices have, have gone down, and natural resources aren't really going to be the, the source of, of prosperity in the next, in the next um, few decades. And really, instead of a competition for natural resources, it, this has been replaced by a competition for human capital. And human capital, it, with the biggest pool of human capital, really, is in Africa now, where we have uh, the largest demographic potential. As you've heard probably several times, Mike Milken mentioned earlier today, we have uh, the youngest continent in Africa. We have a, uh, Africa has a median age of 19, as compared to 37 in the US, for instance, and uh, is as young as uh, 15 in countries like Uganda and 18 in Kenya and Rwanda. And so this is, uh, this is actually a great source of opportunity. And we want to, to collectively make sure that Africa comes out on top of this uh, war for talent and this, uh, this, this, this competition, which is, could be a friendly competition. Um, and the, the thing is, that it could go both ways. It could go either way. There could be um, a lot of opportunity, or there could be uh, some room for, for crisis and unemployment and you know, poor, poor, poor opportunities for, the, for this talent. And so that's what we've decided to discuss together. Um, we'll, we're joined here by Clara Kamanzi, who's the CEO of the Rwandan Development Board. You've also spent seven years as uh, the president for strategy and uh, policy for uh, His Excellency Paul Kagame. So thank you very much as uh, embodying leaders in Africa to be here with us today. And Frank Aswani, you uh, are the vice president of the African Leadership Academy, looking at uh, talent and leadership skills for younger um, African youth from ages 16 to 19. Yep. So thank you so much for being here. Daphne, you're the CEO of World Quant University, which uh, really is an online, you'll tell us more about it, a free online master's in financial engineering, where a lot of your actual your students in this first year have been from Africa. Jing Dong, you're the vice president and treasurer of the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, and also a valued partner in our Milken Institute IFC Capital Markets Training Program, where we have several fellows from our training program in the room with us today as well. And Jen Price, you're the CEO and president of the Calvert Foundation and active in um, 80 countries. And so we're really excited to have you here to provide some more of the business perspective as well. So without further ado, Frank, I'm going to turn to you and ask you, um, in terms of that median age, your really your program addresses those ages across Africa. I think you've been in over 45 countries and over 800 alumni. Yeah. So congratulations. And can you please tell us what sort of skills gaps have you identified over the years and how do you try to, to address them? Yeah, thanks, Carol. So uh, I think when we look at Africa and we see where does Africa need to go? What is the change we require? Who are the people who need to be driving that change? Um, there are a couple of things. One, uh, leadership is a challenge on the continent. Um, I think if you look at, we've had something like 210 presidents since the 60s. Uh, there are not that many you'd count who've taken their countries to a better place uh, sustainably. Um, we are also looking at the future that Africa is facing, the youngest continent, we think our biggest risk that Africa is facing is youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. We have a generation of young people who are more educated than their parents and have few economic opportunities. What's that life going to look like for them? Um, so with all of those things in mind, uh, uh, amongst uh, other small challenges is, so what does the future Africa need to look like? What kind of skills does it need? Um, we still only have 15% of trade in Africa being into Africa trade. How do we fix that? Our markets on their own are too small. Uh, to sustain significant businesses. And I think our young people will be working for m African multinationals, mm -hmm. but how do we make that happen? And so what we do, we, to, when, when Michael Milken was talking about Strive saying that what Africa lacks, it does not capital, is entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I should think what Africa doesn't lacks is entrepreneurial thinkers, who are entrepreneurs irrespective of their sectors. Because when you talk about entrepreneurs, we tend to focus mainly on the business sector. We need entrepreneurial thinkers in government and in non-profit space in Africa. Because 10 years ago, problems in Africa were bad, were kids with flies on their eyes and stuff like that. 
but problems in Africa today are opportunities. Mm -hmm. Every time someone complains in Africa, there's an entrepreneurial opportunity. But how are we preparing our kids to go for that? So in, our, in the academy, we get 16 to 19 year olds from across Africa looking for kids with especially very strong leadership potential. From 4,000 applications, we take 130 kids. Our need blind application process allows us to get the best talent we can get irrespective of the socioeconomic status. So 70% of our kids are from very poor backgrounds. We get kids from refugee camps in Congo, in Kakuma, in Darfur. Um, kids who would disappear from the radar screen if people like us didn't reach out to them. And um, when we bring them to the academy, we, they do the British system a level, but they also do two years of uh, entrepreneurship and leadership. So we teach the kids how to think entrepreneurially. We believe we can create an entrepreneurial think of any child. And one of the things we believe kids learn by doing so, every kid has run a business on campus. Uh, the for-profits pay taxes to the school, the non-profits benefit from the tax. Each of the businesses reports on external board, so every quarter where people like you come to simulate board conversations and the kids have to run board meetings at 17. Yeah. So you start thinking about the exposure that this kid gives them. And what we've seen, every year we retire, we retire five businesses, we bring on board five. Some of those five are taken by the kids and gone, they go home and they continue to grow them. So one of our kids just so was declared the most impactful, economically empowering youth in the Commonwealth under the age of 29. He's 20, he was 24 and from a business he started on campus. So those are some of the skills we try and see we can improve. Okay, that, yeah. that's, that, that sounds great. And so there's so many uh, skills that you mentioned in terms of that entrepreneurial thinking. And at the same time, there's also some very core technical skills that in specific fields that are very sophisticated um, that you do need to acquire. And so that's, that's something, Jing Dong, in the financial industry, which we all know is, is a high level of, of technical complication. Um, that's, that's one of the reasons that we decided collectively to, to develop this uh, capital markets training program, which is very focused on what Capital, poli capital markets policymakers need to know. So, do you want to give us a little bit the, the rationale behind the program and why, what skills it was um, filling for you in terms of as IFC does business in these countries? Thank you, Carol. Um, for those for those of you who don't know IFC very well, we are part of the World Bank Group uh, that, that focuses on supporting private sector and supporting entrepreneurship. Uh, so, we invest about 18 billion dollars in over 100 countries every year, uh, 10 from our own balance sheet, 8 billion that we crowd in from commercial investors. So I think uh, during lunch, uh, Mr. Milken mentioned our program. I was very, very honored to be part of this uh, program that trains future leaders in Africa. So before I elaborate a little bit, let me just quickly share three anecdotes that, that demonstrate the potential and the opportunities in Africa. The first is that uh, recently I've spoken at uh, a University of, uh, of Rwanda in Kigali, and I spoke at, uh, uh, to college students in Togo Lomi, and I also spoke with uh, students at London School of Economics. And I can assure you there is no information gap in the quality of questions. Mm -hmm. A really internet digital age has brought up the, the level to be the same. The second anecdote, 20 years ago, if you want to travel from Lagos to Abidjan, you have to go to London or, or Paris. I just came back from a five country trip uh, in, uh, in West Africa, uh, and I traveled from one capital to another using local airlines. On time, clean, and uh, safe. I started my international career very fortunately 25 years ago in Abidjan. At that time, it seems like half of the continent was in civil conflict, whether it's Sierra Leone, Liberia, Mozambique, Democ Democratic Republic Congo, or Zaire, Eritrea, uh, uh, Rwanda, uh, uh, Burundi. Um, and then when I was traveling through airport at that time, more, more often than not, there was you know, effort to shake you down a little bit. But now you travel to Africa countries, it's us, <laughs> routine as any other country. So I just want to lay down yeah. those because I've been traveling and working in Africa for, for 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, as a financial professional, when we have our conversation, how we can nurture entrepreneurship, access to finance is really the key. I think the, the, the recognition that country would never achieve its economic potential without a deep, liquid, functioning capital market that can efficiently intermediate between savings and <coughs> private sector investment. And that is really something that Africa desperately needs. 
where national leaders, finance minister, governors of central bank recognize the importance, the capacity in government is not there. So for us to build a functioning capital market, we really have to bring capacity to bring the regulators, government officials to a level that they understand and they feel comfortable and they can push for capital market development. So that's why with, uh, with Mike, a couple of years ago, we had this idea of how can we use our experiences to train those regulators, to train government officials, but very different than academic training, right? We approach it from a practitioner's perspective. So we partnered ISC Milken Institute with George Washington University, where we designed a nine month course. Half of it is academic training, but using case studies of how ISC was able to help Rwanda in launch a capital market. Uh, so that, you know, this is a practitioner's approach. The other half is through Milken Institute's network, placing them at internship at US financial institutions, private equity fund, hedge fund. So that after nine months, they are really equipped with, with real world knowledge how financial market works. So our goal is, <laughs> as Mr. Milken said, we should train a thousand such, uh, such uh, 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 regulators. And in five, 10 years time, they will be finance ministers. Mm -hmm. They will be central bank governors. They will be chair, chairman, chairwoman of their security exchange. And once you have a cadre of champions of capital market, we will have an accelerated trajectory in providing finance to private sector. Exactly. I mean, I, I totally agree. I have a bias since I've been working on this program myself yeah. as well uh, from the start. And uh, not only will it be opportunities for the private sector, but employment opportunities for the population as well. Sorry. And uh, we keep telling the, the fellows of the program that the biggest resource they have is actually themselves and each other. And that's also um, something that we'll be discussing later is the alumni networks and the value of exchange across different mm -hmm. countries. So th thanks so much for that, Jing Dong. You also mentioned the internet and the digital age and the, the changes that it's bringing about and in fact not everyone can afford to spend or can take the time to mm. spend eight months in DC like these fellows have and we really appreciate their commitment so Daphne your, your program that uh, you've you've launched uh, with the support of World Quant is um, an entirely online program for two years and provides a, a full master's in, yeah. in can you tell yeah. us more about that sure so uh, yes yeah, so uh, World Quant University is a non-for-profit um, with the mission to advance global education and to uh, afford people who have talent the opportunity to access uh, the resources and educational resources to advance their learning and their economic outcomes. Uh, we have, uh, at this point, we've just over a year, started over a year ago, we have over 600 students um, uh, in nearly 40 countries and uh, over 40, close to 45 percent of our students are in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, some of the dem demographics are very interesting. We have 75% uh, of our students, so it's, it's a master's program, so it requires a bachelor's degree. 75% uh, of those students in Africa um, uh, have a bachelor's, and another 25% already have a master's or a PhD. Um, so financial engineering, it is a two-year program uh, that includes everything from financial management to Python and machine learning. Uh, very 21st century skills that we think are going to be critical for uh, the workforce that you're describing. Mm -hmm. um, we've, uh, the students are advancing, we'll have our first graduates at the end of this year. And the demographics are very interesting. We have 150 students in Nigeria. Uh, we have uh, nearly 40 students in Kenya. And uh, then a dozen here, a dozen there. And um, one of our goals, and we'll talk about it later, but yes, is to, to sort of help people get these credentials and then become part of an ecosystem that fosters economic opportunity. And obviously, all of this is great, but it's based, outcome-based. And so to create, um, uh, help create the jobs and the economic opportunities that are going to um, foster itself and create, have a network effect that all of us are obviously very interested in. Fantastic. So, so Claire, turning to the employers, if you will, uh, if you're, you know, in as a member of the cabinet of Rwanda, or you're you're at the Rwandan Development Board. How would you see this pipeline of talent? How would you see the skills that are being provided? What are the the gaps when you look to to recruit? And also, what are the most impactful? Um, 
sources of talent that you've been able to tap into, especially given that Rwanda is one of the most nimble economies of, Afri of Africa that we've been working with, and you're always thinking ahead of the curve. Thank you. Um, so, so my day job is uh, to promote Rwanda and to talk to people that have capital all over the world to invest in Rwanda. In doing that, I have to convince them why Rwanda is a good investment location. Recently, I had a delegation from Asia, and I told them you know, why they should invest in Rwanda. I told them Rwanda is the second easiest place to do business. In Africa, I told them uh, Rwanda is uh, one of the fastest growing economies on the continent at an average of 7%. I told them that we are you know, the least corrupt country on the continent, and all these very many achievements that, government, that, that Rwanda has, has had. And somebody walked to me later and said, uh, it's, it's amazing that your country has been able to achieve all this after having only come from a very difficult history with the genocide in 1994. And he said, is it because you've educated more people that you're now able to uh, do all the things that you're doing? And then I, rem I reminded this person that actually the genocide in Rwanda in 1994 was masterminded by the elite in the country. The doctors, the engineers, the politicians, those that you know, were educated were the ones that were actually engineering the, the, the genocide. And so if that's the case, then he asked me, what, what is different right now? And I think that what is really important, as we've seen in Rwanda, is that if you're going to develop a human capital that is of value and that can change the continent, you need people that can both combine what they know in their minds with what they feel in their hearts. And I think that has always been the missing link. Um, in Rwanda, we call that concept agachiro. How do you give people a sense of dignity, self-worth, um, and integrity to drive what they know and the skills that they know in terms of uh, being engineers or doctors so that, one, they care more? I think in Africa, we need people that care more. We need a youth that cares. Uh, if you see and talk to, one of the things that I do actually now is that I support uh, President Kagame, who has been appointed to reform the African Union. And if you talk to people about what they think of the African Union, there's a lot of cynicism. They're very cynical about the leaders, about the future of the continent. And perhaps that's why the most educated want to find opportunities in Europe or in, in, in America, or you know, they sink on ships trying to get to another part of the world. And that's because uh, they feel that there's no future that they have on the continent. But how do you uh, build a people, a capital, uh, that actually looks at uh, the continent as a place they value and they want to be and they want to associate with and that they really care about? And I think once you have people that care enough, in addition to knowing enough, then they can use the skills that they study in school uh, to actually do something and make a difference uh, on the continent. So in Rwanda, uh, we think that the biggest difference has been how we've been able to connect the two, the hearts and the minds of the people, and how we've been able to not just teach you how to become a good accountant, but to know why you want to become a good accountant. Because you want to make sure that this country moves from being an aid-dependent country to a country that is self-sustaining. And once people know that, then they care enough. And once they remember where they've come from, it's not just studying and replicating what school has taught you. It's really being able to understand that you're being equipped to change something, to solve a problem that, the, continent, that the, 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 the country has, and to be part of a vision, a common purpose that the country has. That's exactly so. This concept of Agachiro, we could just have used that instead of saying building a meaningful life for the theme of the conference. Right? Yeah. It's, 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 it's goes to the, the, the core. It goes to the core of why we're we're all here for, for this conference. So 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 thank you for that. And in, in terms of, of caring more, uh, Jen, you work with with so many businesses and opportunities that that really care and try to make a social impact in their investments. So can you tell tell us a little bit more about that, and in particular what potential these businesses see um, in Africa? Uh, and, and what they look for in terms of the talent there. Yeah, you bet. So my day job is leading Calvert Social Investment Foundation. And the lens I bring to this conversation is what we do. And what we do is we raise capital from private US investors. Uh, we've raised about a billion and a half over our two decades. Uh, individuals buy a note for as low as $20, and they're moving from their heart when they buy mm -hmm. this note. So mm -hmm. very you know, moving, Claire. It's similar, we're finding our investors, the reason they want to engage their capital with us, because they want it heart and head connected, a social and a financial return. With that money, we lend to organizations, and there's a great proportion of our money that goes into the continent of Africa. And really, it goes in in two ways. One, it goes to funds or intermediaries that then are on lending to businesses in place, 
or at times we lend directly to businesses that are building social businesses in all sectors, so renewable energy, health, education, financial inclusion. And what we see is one of the greatest challenges our businesses are facing is talent. They do not have enough local talent to scale their businesses. And you know that's what we're seeing, but interesting enough, it jives with what others are seeing too. So RippleWorks, it's an NGO in the Silicon Valley, they did a study, uh, they surveyed hundreds of businesses that were developing and asked them what was holding you back. And at the early stage, when they're unfunded, they said number one is access to finance, number two is talent. However, when you move them along, and they're now at the point where they're scaling their business, they are funded, they say number one is talent. And so talent is one that actually becomes a challenge over time. It was the only factor when asked of these businesses what was holding you back that's growing over time. Um, so taking that and then just thinking too of how economies expand, when you look at the World Economic Forum, they'll cite that 80% of jobs in low-income countries are generated through small business enterprises. And 90% of jobs in a given year are created through small business enterprises. So really supporting that piece of the market can, can create great returns for the economy and for people seeking employment, seeking quality jobs. So part of what you know, I'm bringing to this yeah. conversation is as an investor really looking to put money to work, really to put more money into the continent, um, we see a great need for more talent development for all the work that's being done on the panel. And now you know, part of I know the conversation we're going to get into is mm -hmm. how do we harness, yeah. how do we match that talent mm -hmm. to the need. No, exactly. Thank you. And if you could maybe expand a little bit in terms of the businesses that you work with, how do some of them incorporate talent within their, their models and what are some best practices there? How can businesses themselves and not just you know, training institutions and, and, and policy makers play a role? Yeah, so I'll start that I yeah. think this will probably turn into the very fluid part of the panel because <laughs> yeah. we all see this from different sure. lenses. But from the businesses I work with, I see it kind of bifurcated in two pieces. One, acquiring talent, and then developing talent within their business. Um, professional and senior leadership, so all the way to the most senior levels. Mm -hmm. um, acquiring talent, um, what we're starting to see very interesting are new businesses emerging that are almost acting as matchmakers across the continent. So really looking at resumes for their potential and their competency, not who you know or where you went to school, and beginning to matchmake opportunities with people. One group that I've admired, a startup really recently, is called Shortlist. Um, they are doing a wonderful job in matchmaking talent across the continent. Then on the uh, kind of developing side, it's a little bit more of a spectrum. Um, when businesses are kind of really starting out, we often hear from them, oh, we're too busy, we don't have time to focus on developing our talent internally. And what we're seeing is some of the best players are reaching out to others. You know, probably even some of the people on this panel to, play, to be collaborators, to say, hey, we have this great talent pool. Can you help us bring skill sets to them so they can grow into more senior leadership, so they can acquire the skills of a salesperson, of a bookkeeper, and begin to advance their skill set in a specialized way? Mm -hmm. And then we're seeing on the other end some impact funds that are incorporating TA, technical assistance around talent, right into the core of their business model mm -hmm. and seeing that be very successful. And, and you know, one just example that comes right to mind is I was there a few weeks ago in Kenya and there's a fund called the Medical Credit Fund, which is working to develop healthcare clinics, providing them financing for expansion for medical equipment. Um, but what else are they doing? They're really helping these founders of these clinics. So people who have made this their life work to build this clinic in a community over 20 and 30 years, to help them think about thoughtfully exiting their business so they can retain wealth, so they can pass wealth on. And that means they need to also cultivate a new generation of leadership within their business. And they've actually, Medical Credit Fund in this situation, has partnered with the University of Nairobi, and they've created a course 
for these leaders to go and to learn some of the tactical skills to do this and then to think out thoughtfully, to think like an entrepreneur in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, these are medical doctors, right? So to give them that skill set as well to gracefully exit their business and to pass it on to the next generation. Great. I mean, that, and that matchmaking function is something that I think several of us uh, would have would have something to say about in terms of the pipeline of, of talent. And and I think Daphne, your program and Frank as well um, seek not just to provide that training, but the ex, ex post you have a function in terms of providing them with with employment. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think I just want to make one point. Several comments that were made. I guess that I think. Uh, one of the things I think is important in this conversation in terms of something that traditionally financial engineering has been seen as something that's very focused on the investment community, that what we're increasingly seeing, and this is certainly true in the United States, is that this is a skill set that's needed across businesses. So, you know, the manager of, of the future is not going to be someone who does it in Excel. They're going to use Python to take a whole bunch of data sets and a whole bunch of inputs to make better business decisions. So it's you know, the CFO's role increasingly is not just one of reporting, but it's actually one of product development, helping make decisions about growth and so on. And so there's a certain set of skills that are required for that. And in some sense, I think, you know, like in the past, I've had experience in the past in Eastern Europe many years ago, where you had a talent pool of people <laughs> who had no technology at all. And when the opportunity came, they moved for the most advanced um, <coughs> tools, technology tools, and were not burdened by legacy systems in some sense. And I think that's probably something we may well see, hopefully see, in Africa, where 21st century skills, there is, you're going from, from talent, but not necessarily of the burden of a certain experience to taking advantage of the most current tools that exist to advance your economies. And you know, from our perspective, and whether it's in data science or other areas, we can all sit and talk about um, you know, laying sensors all over fields all over Africa. But if you don't have people who know how to interpret that data and make use of it to make better decisions, then it's not going to take us very far. And that's certainly not just true in Africa. But again, I think the, the, the absence of legacy gives us an opportunity to leapfrog into something that is very 21st century. Yeah. Carol, let me just touch on this talent issue. Because we, um, so our commitment to our kids is lifelong. When you enter the network, you never leave. Um, so talent development and talent identification actually has a very good marriage is from the time the kid goes is in, is in college. So for example, we run an internship program. We probably run Africa's most expensive internship program. So we bring, if I take a step back, we bring 80% of our kids to college in the US. So we have 320 kids studying in the States. So to make sure that these 18 year olds don't get lost, every summer we bring them back to Africa for internships. So we, we run, we run, um, we place 300 interns across 32 African countries. Now 30% of our kids are Francophone. 15% uh, are Lusophone, the rest are Anglophone. But what we find, if you understand the psyche of a young African, especially one who's come, let's say, from a rural area, the first job he'll take will be determined either by an uncle or something. He'll go into banking because his father was a banker. Um, and what the internship program does, it helps this kid really try and identify whether this is something he's passionate about. So we have a kid goes into financial services, he realizes this just won't work for me. And the joy of the U.S. is that they choose their majors at the end of the second year. So as they do their internships, they're aligning them with the selection of majors in college. So we find the internship program helps kids make the right career choices. And studies have also shown that if you do nine months to 12 months of an internship within your undergraduate, you're six times more likely to get your first job than if you did. Okay? And we have, 300 and, we have 261 kids graduating from college from next week. 70, 60 or so of them, percent of them, got jobs coming off the last internship last year. So they went to their final year in college with a job off already. So employers as a private sector, I think you could really help talent development by giving us internships. I mean, just expose kids to what work feels like and looks like. That's a big contribution you can make. Carol, if I, if I want to come in uh, on the role of partnerships in availing mm -hmm. talent uh, mm -hmm. on the continent, and I want to give an example of what we've done in Rwanda. So we, we had this, this big vision of becoming a knowledge-based economy, obviously coming from a very low base. And one of the skills that we thought we needed in the country was um, IT and computer science and engineering. But we didn't have the capacity to do that in the country. 
And so we went to Carnegie Mellon University and told them, you know, uh, can you come and set up um, in Rwanda? And of course, that's something that they were not thinking about at the time. But that has been made possible today uh, with a campus that trains uh, Africans, not just Rwandans. Actually, we have more students now coming from other African countries than uh, from within Rwanda. Uh, getting a Carnegie Mellon University top degree in, you know, in engineering and computer science within Rwanda. And that was possible because, one, uh, the government had to play a role, you know, to give certain incentives for Carnegie Mellon to come. But also we had MasterCard uh, Foundation giving, you know, um, a very good amount of money to support mm -hmm. scholarships on the continent. We had the African Development Bank financing mm -hmm. the construction of um, a university. And now we've seen that with that establishment now, Africa Leadership University, which is an offshoot of the, of the school um, that Frank comes from, coming to set up next to uh, the, uh, the Carnegie Mellon University. And then we have the African Mathematical Institute also come to establish next to Carnegie Mellon University. So you, you, you see a cluster mm -hmm. uh, being created because there are partnerships between um, financial institutions, between you know, a university, a top university in, in, the, in, in, the, in the world, and uh, MasterCard Foundation. Now, what's important to note is that you're getting a global education, but in a local context. Yeah. And that local context is very, very important mm -hmm. in our view because when t students come to Rwanda, uh, they tell you that they actually have learned also a lot from just being within the Rwandan con context because they learn uh, our history, they learn uh, lessons from what we've done. They, for example, highlight something we call Umuganda, mm -hmm. which is a, a monthly exercise. When you come to Kigali, everybody will tell you, oh my God, you're so clean, the streets are clean and all that. But one of the reasons for that, uh, that we are able to keep a clean city is that we have this, this program called Umuganda, where every end of the month, everyone leaves their home from about seven in the morning to 11, and they clean the streets, they clean, they just make sure the environment is really clean. When they finish cleaning, they sit around and discuss, you know, you know, you know where are we, who are we, where, what do we want to achieve, what are the problems we're facing, and how can we resolve them? And that conversation um, is something that is very valuable. And these kids who come from other countries to study computer, computer engineering, mm -hmm. not only go out with a computer engineering that is a Carnegie Mellon global education, but it's very much localized from learning uh, within the Rwandan context. And I think they go back very rich mm -hmm. students. And so these kids, do they come, what sort of proportion of those students are not from Rwanda? Initially, we had more Rwandans than, than, than um, non-Rwandans, but now more than half is non-Rwandan. Yeah. I have to say, I, I visited the campus. I was really, really impressed. Uh, it's really nurturing top class uh, 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 IT and engineers uh, within Africa. Carol, I think this is really a good time for me to, uh, to put it together into a macro, uh, 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 macro sense. That is, when we talk about agent of change uh, in Africa, I think there are different entry points. Uh, everybody here, you know, uh, add so much value. From IFC and the World Bank Group uh, perspective, we wanted the agent change starting from the very top of the government, right? From the president and prime minister recognizing that for, for economy to grow, private sector has to be front and center. And for private sector to, to thrive, your regulatory framework, your enabling environment, uh, your capital market, financial market have to be there, right? So I think. To, to identify senior national leaders as agent of change is critically important. So that dialogue with government is critical. The second layer is really identify entrepreneurs that can role model and make huge success with, within the continent. And we have, we have many examples of that. But I think a third element, which is, uh, which is uh, equally important, is really use actual projects to demonstrate. So this morning in a different panel, I showcased an IC project uh, where in Ghana, uh, the World Bank Group uh, was able to work with the private sector uh, to, uh, um, you know, to have a $8 billion project concluded last year. This is to explore the offshore gas uh, and which will power about 1,000 megawatts of future power, which is about a third of Ghana's capability uh, or, or power generation capability. You know, th the way that we are able to assure the government, the private sector, that our, our, our financial arrangement structuring is, is something that made it work, right? To, to, to crowding about $8 billion. And that role model of a mega project that Mozambique, Tanzania, would say, mm -hmm. I want to do the same mm -hmm. thing, right? 
So agent of change is really about rule modeling. And, and Rwanda is a terrific example, because Rwanda is running ahead of all the other countries, mm -hmm. laying fiber optics, you know, attracting the top university uh, uh, from the United States, shooting up in their ranking of doing ease of doing business for private sector. And other countries want to learn. How can we all build using the building blocks, mm -hmm. young leaders, entrepreneurs? So in entrepreneurship, we should also include government officials. They also have to display mm -hmm. a level of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. in saying, how can I help the private sector? Mm -hmm. How can I market my country mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to the whole world? Mm -hmm. I, I think you know, this is quite exciting uh, time for us to, to, to do this. Final thing, you mentioned that commodity collapsed a couple of years ago. So for a lot of commodity reliant countries in Africa, I actually think this is a blessing in disguise because mm -hmm. this is actually a perfect time, for example, for Democratic Republic Congo to diversify into agribusiness, service industry, you know, manufacturing, and so on and so forth. So I think these agent of change is not only about people, it's about ideas. Uh, one more thing, maybe, sorry. J just, so I met a, a group of young uh, Ivorian entrepreneurs. Most of them graduate from Harvard, from Paris universities. In addition to going back to their country, creating businesses, they actually created a think tank. And that think tank would discuss and come up with policy suggestions for government. Then they would have a closed door conversation with Minister of Finance, Minister of Mining, and saying, look, we as entrepreneurs, if you solve these policy problems, mm -hmm. good things will happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's also agent mm -hmm. of change. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I would just add one thing to that really nicely laid out framework of how can we really create these agents of change? And that's coming from my view again. But some of the work we do is also around gender equity. Mm -hmm. And so how do we engage the full population, yeah. mm -hmm. um, both by income disparity and also gender differences. Mm -hmm. And some of the work we're doing along that we recognize is systems change. It's not truly about counting how many women or men are in a program, but how do we create systems that enable women to engage in the program mm -hmm. full stop? Mm -hmm. So do they have the supporting services and amenities so they can finish school? Mm -hmm. And these are long-term, I know, conversations, but it's very much part of the work we're doing is to think about that element too. So we get all the economy yeah. engaged in what we want to see come out the other end. And we know too that when we do that, we have greater growth outcomes. By the way, can I just add that many senior officials in Rwanda are women, and <laughs> half of the parliament are women. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I wanted to make actually rather than a, a macro comment, a micro comment, which is that I think that one of the things, again, we're very early stages and we, we as I said, we won't have graduates till the end of this year, but one of the things we're going to start experimenting with are, are meetups. Mm -hmm. So um, we are hoping as we've now explored that there are clusters of yeah. students, for example, mm -hmm you know, that 20 of our students live in Lagos. Well, what can we do, and here they are in an online university setting, how can we help them meet one another? And my guess is that among, if you put 20 people together, terms, not everyone is a leader, uh, but probably one of them is, mm -hmm. and you could conceivably create a community of people who might in a peer-to-peer -peer way help one another to, to take entrepreneurial risks and to engage in a way that they might not otherwise in these very sort of either very corporate, very government, very ministry driven ways, you kind of need it to be a little scrappy almost for them to find each other and yeah. take that risk. So that would be, that if you, know, if you ask me, that would be just a, a kind of dream outcome mm -hmm. of this that would be unexpected, but I think is certainly uh, mirrored in other places in the world in terms of how that happens. And I think that's why we also are having this conversation is how to connect our alumni network, mm -hmm. even if it's an online program for when our alumni go yes. back mm -hmm. home, how, how can they, they connect with each other and be, provide employment opportunities for your alumni or internship opportunities and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So that's, that comes, comes back to having this collaboration across all the different um, organizations, including the businesses that really see a business case in, in investing in this. 
Um, in terms of just wanted to come back to that proof of concept you were, you were talking about, Jing Dong, because it's true that beyond just building the skill and the talent, often, particularly in Africa, there's a risk perception, and that gap, you can only basically a picture or concept speaks more than, than anything else. And so if you can have a few successful projects, it's, it really makes a big difference. And so I just wanted to turn to you, Jen, if there's some cases of those sort of catalyst projects that have uh, brought a lot more alongside, and where, where did leaders and agents of change in Africa, for instance, uh, where was someone really in that agency role? Yeah, it's a great question because you know, there's two pieces to this. One is, you know, some of the conversation we've talked about up to now, we see where there's just constant skill set needs to. So I will go to the other yeah, side, yeah. you know, but sometimes it's good too to talk about the challenges. Mm -hmm. And that is honestly around this finance capacity, mm -hmm. um, having these CFOs, just like you said, that have um, the ability to be a little bit more strategic and visionary. We see that as a real um, you know, someone with five to 15 years experience that's really going to grow a business strategically alongside other, other senior leaders. We see that as a constant challenge for many of our organizations. Um, so we see these types of gaps. And then on the other side, we see businesses that are creating leadership programs, really building skill sets at the entry level. Um, and I would say there's some great examples of businesses doing this. And the interesting thing is at times they don't retain all their talent. They're kind of, it goes out into the field. And, you know, I think some businesses are starting to be more thoughtful about the talent they train, how to retain them, and that's kind of the second phase we're starting to see. Because if I step back, we've been investing in Africa for a number of years now, 10, 15, and the change has been dramatic. Uh, to be very honest, we used to invest directly in Africa through European fund managers. Now there's fund managers, there's businesses on the continent. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge change. And now how do we just scale that type of talent? Um, and I think what we're seeing is some of these businesses on the continent are doing best in class stuff. Yeah. It's just getting the capacity to scale that work is really what we're seeing as the next challenge. Okay. Yeah, but if you can come yeah. in there, uh, uh, one example that we've, we've seen in terms of scaling up um, talent that's available in the country in different fields has been having a very liberal immigration policy. Yeah. So uh, training and, and having you know the, sh the skills shortage corrected is a very long-term project, and we recognize that. And economic development is not going to wait for you to have enough skills um, when you do. So what we've done is... Uh, there's, some countries have actually a surplus of skills. Uh, for example, Kenya supplies over 2,000 skilled you know, professionals to Rwanda every year. What we've done is, number one, we've made it very easy for people to come to, to the country to find jobs. So if, you're, if you hold an African passport, uh, you don't have to look for a visa to come to Rwanda. You get a visa on arrival. So you, you can come and explore opportunities anytime, and there will be no immigration uh, handicap to doing that. And then if you come from the East African region and East African community, we also give work permits, and we have guaranteed um, investor skilled uh, programs where you can bring a skill from all over the all over the country, all over the world that you think you need uh, for your investment, and so this has helped to correct the, the very huge shortage of skills that we had within the country. That has been very helpful. Frank, in terms of, uh, well, I wanted to, to ask you about two things. One of them is, in terms of the, this employment opportunities, how much do you have um, students working in other countries from the countries that they're, they're from in, originally, and how much cross-Africa sort of exchanges do you have in the long term? And related to that, uh, we're talking about retention and businesses retaining. In some cases, um, at least for us, for instance, we don't want uh, our internship providers in the U.S. to keep, and they understand this, to keep the talent that interns with them, the, the idea is that the policymakers go back to Africa and contribute to Africa, and, and this is in complete understanding with our internship providers. But in your case, your, your students go to, to the U.S., a lot of them go to the U.S., how many of them really come back? Because that's one of the, the big challenges as well. Yeah, so roughly 70% of our kids come back within a month of graduation. Very good. Um, and the reason is because, actually, we have great opportunities in Africa. Let's not forget that. Um, but what this, a lot of these millennials want is the one connections to those opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we have a department called the Africa Careers Network that works with corporate partners to find both internship and career opportunities. And we have no problem repatriating our kids, um, no problem at all. Um, 
and, and to the, the skills gap, I mean, we, we work with everyone from GE, Google, Microsoft, IBM, to small nonprofits doing work in the slums of Kibera or Nairobi or whatever. So that, that for us is not a problem. But you know, with some student visas, you're allowed to work in the US for an extra two years on your OPT, and that we allow. Um, so, so from that perspective, I think, I think um, it works very well. But if you think about just ability of Africans to go, so for example, we had a client the other day, so I, I, I lead on all our corporate partnerships. We had a client who came to us and told us, guys, I need engineers in South Africa. Um, so we were out of South African engineers. So we called UCT and told UC, University of Cape Town, can you send us engineers? They sent us three Kenyans. <laughs> and, and the person in South Africa only wanted South African engineers. We have, University of Rochester gives us 15 scholarships a year for the engineering program but not all of them are South African. So we have a lot of engineers sitting outside South Africa, but they can't get work permits to work in South Africa. Mm -hmm. In contrary, I mean, I, I love Rwanda to bits uh, because mm -hmm. we take all sorts of Africans to work in Rwanda. It's no problem at all. Mm -hmm. And especially the East Africa community now and the partnership that's working there. Uh, and anyone who's worked in Africa knows, you know, in Africa you do business, you, the strength of your network really supports your ability to be impactful in, in business. So um, the ability for us to to have interconnected Africans is significant, not just for their short-term success, but long-term success. So I wish a lot more of regionalization would actually speak to the talent movement, uh, which is now a, a commodity. We can't uh, ring fence and say that we want mm -hmm. this and that stuck to deter determined by immigration laws. But, but that's, that's a major frustration point for us, is we, we have, I have a talented kid in Senegal now, that I, an engineer from Duke, I, that I can't find a, ro a role for because we don't have engineering opportunities in Senegal that I can plug him into. And there are not many other places he can go to work. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the sad bit about the politics in Africa, to be honest. And that's where the sort of immigration needs to talk to you, education needs to talk to you, yeah. all the other ministries. And, yeah. and also to address the issue of, of brain drain, yeah. uh, I, I think um, leadership is very important on the continent. Um, leadership that gives people you know, people leave because there's, there's no hope they see in their, in, in, the, in their future. But with all the changes that the, the continent is having, there's a lot more hope of what's, in what's happening. There's a lot more, you know, people look forward to the future a lot more than they did before. And I think that's why um, we get less people coming out of the continent. Uh, and they don't have to make the same money they make in New York or in Wall Street. As long as they know that they're working and changing lives on their continent and, uh, and that the future is, is bright, that's yeah. the most important. And leaders have a role in, in ensuring that. No, that, that is true, and that's why we see a lot of diasporas <coughs> actually coming back more yes. and more mm -hmm. to, to the continent. So that's that's very encouraging. So that's actually the, the perfect segue in terms of, of knowing that, that there's hope and there's a meaning to coming back. I wanted to uh, close the panel and ask each of you to, um, you know, and opening it up for questions, uh, I wanted to ask each of you to define uh, how you define a meaningful life, to tie it back, and with a, with a little bit of a focus on Africa as well. So, I mean, I think you've, you've already said it, but if there's something that you wanted to add in terms of a meaningful for life, what would you say? Well, very much as I said, uh, I think a meaningful life for an African today is a dignified life. Mm -hmm. And that means that I'm not going to rely on a taxpayer in another country to determine my future mm -hmm. and to determine whether I go to school or whether I get uh, health um, services. I am going to be able to determine my own future mm -hmm. as an African that lives in Africa. and my country can actually help me determine the future that I want or that I can choose, not because I have to be dependent on somebody else. And I think re reaching that level of dignity is what makes an African's life and certainly my life uh, more dignified. And I think it all starts with leadership of a continent that changes the mindset of how they see their role and how they're able to change the lives of the people that they serve. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You should have started from that end. Yeah. Um, how, how to follow up on yeah. that? <laughs> I, I, I think for, for, as an African, for me, we've lived the African problems. We need to live the solution. Mm -hmm. And that for me is what defines a meaningful life on African, is that we know our problems better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to leave the solution, mm -hmm. and we need to own the solution. Mm -hmm. So um, s we need to support a lot more and, uh, of African-driven solutions to African mm -hmm. problems. Uh, and I think that, for me, is what will drive our success mm -hmm. and the min creating meaningful lives for Africans, generally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, um, not as an African, but as um, I think that, that um, 
the opportunity to create and or to contribute to giving people opportunity mm -hmm. and I think we've repeatedly said talent is the resource mm -hmm. and so the more that we can do to uh, make that match so that all the things you're talking about can be further um, engendered and supported and grow um, I think is a uh, 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 is something we can do and um, certainly for me personally would very much contribute to uh, adding meaning to my life to be able to to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. Well generally speaking if tomorrow is better than today that is a very meaningful <laughs> thing to look forward to. Um, I think just like an American dream, uh, uh, an Africa dream should be the same. That is the African person born in an Africa country uh, knowing what's possible in the world has the, has the confidence that their opportunity to get better is no different yeah. than people from other continents. Mm -hmm. I think that really would be uh, yeah. a meaningful yeah. life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just to echo every comment, and having that opportunity to democratize. So no matter where you mm -hmm. sit, um, it's not about who you know or what school you went to. It's about your potential, your capabilities. And so from that place, knowing that there's opportunity for you mm -hmm. um, really um, is quite, I would think, um, for me at least, that's the meaning we're yeah. trying to lift up in mm -hmm. the work that we're doing on the continent. Well, thank, thank you all so much for, for those inspiring words. I, I'd like to open it up. We have 10 minutes where we can have some, a few questions. So um, I'm sure there's, there's a, a lot of questions out there. Please, well, maybe we'll take two. Yeah. Wilson? Um, I, I just wanted to ask uh, Ampa Milson from uh, Angola. And uh, my question is about uh, networking. Um, as a governmental institution, for example, we import a lot of services from Western countries. Say, for example, Portugal to solve, to help us like solve a lot of issues that we have in our market. Um, but one thing that I've realized it is that sometimes, you know, an African peer might have been through the same problem. So my question is like, in your view, what are like the most effective way that we can sort of network with each other and try to tackle, you know, similar problems that, for example, Kenya has had and, you know, we are having now or so on. Thanks. Uh, we had, uh, I'll take two more questions and, uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kobe Kumson. I'm a former ambassador of Ghana to U.S. Uh, I, I really compliment, uh, I want to compliment what each of the panelists has said this afternoon. There's one issue that I'd just like to draw all your attention to, and the single underlying issue that will help promote change on the continent was addressed at the very beginning of this, of this, of this uh, discussion, which was availability of capital. Oftentimes, the capital into Africa either comes from the sale of uh, raw materials, a substantial portion of every country's budget comes from a donor country. Yet we know that, and I remember back in middle 2000s that uh, the World Bank put out a report, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the minimum amount of stolen money from Africa in various foreign banks was somewhere around between 150 billion to about 200 billion dollars. I may be mistaken. But even if, even if it's $100 billion, and we're talking about the lack of capital, and you're all trying very hard to put funds onto the continent, although it doesn't scratch the top, the surface. I mean, I'm on the continent eight, nine times a year. So if there can be a discussion, and especially to the moderator, mm -hmm. perhaps the next discussion, because this is a very sensitive area, the next discussion, how do we tap into the various world leaders that we know may have harbored part of the stolen money that Africa has in the various banks in these countries, to sensitize them to really return some of these monies to the continent as a basis for all the things that we're talking about, you know, skill set development. The young 
when you travel across the breadth of the country, as I've done, are very entrepreneurial. They're very aggressive. Yep. They know what's going on around the world. Okay, so well, they have the funds. For sure. they thank you very stuff. much. Um, thank you very much. We'll take one more question. And if you just keep uh, the question over there. Thanks for a great discussion. Um, I'm just wondering uh, regarding the academy and the online university, uh, in terms of the male female ratio, if you're satisfied with your numbers or what you might be doing to improve your numbers. Uh, it just seems to me that digital may lower the barriers to entry for, for young women. Um, and on the academy side, Leadership Academy, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on, on attracting more women if, if need be. Thank you. So I guess so to start with the, the networking question from Mo Milton, who's one of our IFC Malcolm Institute fellows, um, and the alumni network is about to kick off. So uh, I guess would either of you have a, any ideas in terms of the networking element? Yes. So, 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 so we, we, we strongly, I totally agree with you. So we deliberately bring our alumni together every summer when they're in Africa, back in Africa for internship. So we run reunions uh, across uh, Lagos and Dakar, we'll tend to do West Africa, jo Johannesburg, do Southern Nairobi and Rabat. And, and it's amazing just what comes out of those multi-generational um, layers of ALA alumni coming together every year. Um, the issue I have is that we still are not connecting enough with other similar organizations. Um, there's a lot of investment going into youth development and entrepreneurship development and leadership development in Africa, but we're still very siloed in our approach. And I, actually, that's one of the things I'd love some of the big organizations like USAID or IFC to do is to find a convening platform where all of these multiple um, African uh, youth investment opportunities can come together. But I, it's, it's probably the best thing you can do, to be honest. So I, I guess one comment I would make is that I think that these things are successful when they're peer-to-peer. -peer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, you know, we can build an alum network, but I think it sounds like a great business idea, actually, for you, you know, in the spirit of entrepreneurship in Africa, is to create some sort of network of people who share best practices with each other. Uh, surely, more is in common across countries, and I think your point is right. You don't need to recreate the wheel each time. You need to, to, to build on each other's ability. And, uh, but again, I think that that, uh, I think, uh, certainly I think from the university, our perspective, our, my perspective would be to, to um, facilitate that on a platform. But it only works if uh, the peer-to-peer -peer group uh, feels a commitment and, and that's where the stickiness comes uh, rather than some other sort of, you know, paternal organization coming and enabling that. I don't, I think that's very contrary to the spirit of what we're talking about um, over decades, right? So. If we turn to gender, no, just, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the gender is terrible. Oh. <laughs> I mean, in, I mean, in our students, it's, it's 89% uh, male and 11% female. And I would welcome any suggestions in the room about how to, to rebalance that a little bit. Uh, again, I, I, th I mean, it, it mirrors what is true in computer science, data sciences, finance often, um, that it, it is, does skew male. And I think it's something, an effort that we can certainly make to improve those numbers, certainly among the women that were in your mm -hmm. program, um, which was you know, impressively yeah, balanced. Yeah, so I'll, I'll re uh, rebound on that as well, is that for the women in our program, uh, this year out of 18 fellows, we, we only had four women, which, was, um, which, which we really wanted to do better. But what we, we, we actually have done better, we've uh, had the new class of right. applications where it's um, actually completely balanced. We have 50-50 in terms of ten, 10 women and 10, 10 men, and we're going to announce that, that class soon. But but what was great there was that we actually had a balance in the number of applicants too. So it wasn't just that um, you know we, we tried to actively select mm -hmm. more women, but we had as many women applying as men. I so. think some of it it's identifying organizations mm -hmm. in Africa, whether they're you know among mathematicians or business women or whatever it might be, identifying groups that have already self-identified, mm -hmm. and then um, making our, our program known to them and, and supporting that. And Jingno, I think it's almost over, so please, if yeah. you want to. Yeah. So the world is not for lack of money. When 8 trillion sits in negative interest rate, when over 20 trillion earning literally nothing, um, when, on the other hand, when you well, very well structure a project, we have no shortage of partners to come with IFC to a project in Africa, right? So the bottleneck is really creating an enabling environment to welcome private sector, 
creating the regulatory and market infrastructure to connect savings, domestic and international, to private sector opportunities. So there are macro efforts that we are making. On the other hand, it is also true that how do we nurture more entrepreneurship bottom up, and as some of my fe f uh, fellow panelists are doing. So hopefully, you know, that's where we can solve, mm -hmm. solve the funding problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I can come in there as well, on, on the issue of funding, um, I saw a statistic beginning of this year that 97% of the budget of the African Union uh, for programs is financed by donors which means almost everything that we do as the African Union in terms of programs is not financed by ourselves. And my, my president likes to say, we can't change the past, but we can determine the future that we want. And so there was a decision by the African Union heads of state recently that um, they should find a solution to finance their own programs from within the continent. So I think that mindset of owning our future and being in charge of what we want, I think is, is crucial in everything, including in, 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 in this area. Um, so the African Union decided that 0.2% of the import uh, duties they get from uh, imports coming to the country is going to finance the African Union. And so taking away that dependency mindset and trying to find solutions where we can even within the continent is possible. And this is what the African Union is trying to do. If I can quickly talk about networking, there are actually a number of initiatives that I, I belong to in the African continent that has been extremely helpful in bringing us together from different parts of the, the continent. The African Leadership Network, which is uh, started by the STEM founder of the Academy, uh, the Young Global Leaders of the World Economic Forum, uh, the Young Presidents Organization of, within the African continent have been extremely helpful. When they want to come and invest in Rwanda, I get calls, I'm looking for this and that and that, and I'm able to connect them, or they're able to bring people from their countries to Rwanda. I think that has been helpful, but I think there's room for a lot more platforms for networking. Okay, well, thank you so much, all the panelists. Thank you for the questions. I think we've had uh, a lot of, of inspira inspiring words in terms of leading meaningful lives, but we've also had a few concrete areas of action going forward, whether it's in terms of uh, proof of concept and successful projects, uh, whether it's businesses incorporating talent more uh, proactively within, within their own strategies, or using you know, digital technology and other ways of connecting uh, alumni with opportunities um, in, in the continent. So thanks again, and uh, we look forward to following the success of our alumni, our recent graduates, as well as your, your forthcoming graduates you. as they go forward and make a change for the better in Africa. Thanks again. Thank you.